I went to high school where there were pump jacks across the street where there was capped and uncapped wells underneath our football field. And so it became part of the landscape and we didn't notice them. About 11 years ago, 10 years ago, we started to notice them again. Folks were feeling those impacts from the bloody noses, the headaches, the dizziness. We started to realize that this was an emerging public health crisis that was happening at these sites, and we have to do something different. Power and Health was made possible by a grant from the California Endowment. What's the first thing that you think about when you hear the word health? For me growing up, my first explicit uh, conception of health was, of course, health care. What's the idea of this health program? I knew that there was something about, you know, having a doctor that you need to be healthy. And maybe sometimes they'll say, Get lots of exercise and fresh air. Fruit, vegetables, you must eat well-balanced meals. Physical activity, diet, nutrition, those things. America's continuing goal is better health for all its citizens. Most people know that health costs us a lot of money. We're not really spending on health. What we're really spending on is on medicine, is on health care. What we're really spending more than $3 trillion a year on is on making ourselves healthy again once we've already become sick. Health, there's many definitions, right? The World Health Organization has talked about being that health is not just an absence of sickness or illness, but the presence of physical, mental, emotional well-being. When I think about health, it's about being able to contribute mentally, financially, being able to breathe without pain, being able to walk without pain, and being valued. Health is really about the ability for you to be efficacious in your life, for you to be able to deal with traumas that might occur mentally or physically, for you to be able to stand in relationship with other people. It's about the food we eat about the water we drink, about the air we breathe. And it's about the forces that shape those conditions. That's what makes us healthy. Now, when you start thinking that way, you realize that the conversation changes. Because if we say we care about our health, well, we should not be talking just about doctors. We should be talking about those conditions. And we should be talking about the forces that generate those conditions. We like the narrative that my health, my well-being, is a function of me pulling myself up by my bootstraps, that I worked hard, that it was my force of will and my hard work that put me in a condition to be healthy today. And whenever we think that way, we forget how much of what I have achieved is a function of both luck and of the conditions of the world around me. Here's one way of telling it. Let's take one of the biggest health success stories of the 20th century, which is how many fewer people today die in car accidents than 100 years ago. Per vehicle mile driven, which means for every mile we drive, we, because now we drive much more, we die about 200 times less than we used to. Is that because we're better drivers? We're not really better drivers. Right, we die less in a car because of seat belts and airbags and laws against drunk driving and shatterproof glass. So we die less in car accidents because we have built safer cars around us. Does 
force of will and achievement matter? Absolutely. Is it determinative of who we are, the conditions around us, and our health? No. So an example, we have a structural pattern in the United States where affordable housing is always in the most toxic and noxious parts of a city or a town. It's next to the power plants. It's next to the train tracks. It's next to the highway where all the particulate matter is being emitted into the air and the exhaust. I think that from my experiences, especially once we were living in low-income housing, one of the things that stood out to me was with my younger brother who has asthma. It was a clear exacerbation and a worsening of his asthma conditions. Indoor air quality is horrible because we live so close to industrial facilities. We had allergens from roaches and from mice. The stress of living in a high crime environment, all these things that would basically be asthma triggers. Every asthma flare up was essentially an emergency. So we'd have to go to the hospital every time and we'd go and he'd get an inhaler and he'd get some other medicine. And each time we went, there'd be like this new thing for asthma, right? Ask your doctor. First, it's like this purple thing and you breathe it in and it worked. Ask your doctor. About Two years later, there's another thing that works even better. So you have this hope, this progress for healthcare, right? Nothing has changed at all about what's causing this to happen. Nobody's coming and doing anything about what's going on with uh, the roaches uh, or the rodents. Nobody's done anything about the air quality. The housing's not getting more affordable. Crime has not been mitigated substantially, right? And so I can just imagine like a situation where it's other folks, uh, and it is other folks out there, that are going through the similar things. They don't have any control over the housing conditions. They don't have any control over the air quality. They don't have any control over the larger social, economic, political context that shapes patterns of violence. All they have control over is whether or not they can get to the emergency room or if they have primary care, possibly, uh, to get an asthma treatment. And that's not solving problems. It's really difficult to quantify exactly how much of our health is due to what, but most summaries suggest that the 10% of our health is the function of doctors and health systems. Then you have a large part of our health due to our health behaviors, whether we smoke, whether we drink. And then there's genetics and luck that really we have no control over. And then you have an even larger part due to our physical and social environments, the places we live, the friends we keep, our opportunity to make stable income. That's really the largest driver of our health. Our health is principally a function of the conditions around us, the context in which we grew up, and the full set of circumstances that lead to who we are today. When you think about the things we all need to be healthy and to be happy and to be living our full lives, you think about the work we might do, you think about the relationships that are most important and how you make sure you have enough time for them. And then you think about where you live, what it feels like to come home, the neighborhood and where you are. And I think that that is what the social determinants of health are all about. People talk about the social determinants of health as those determinants of health and illness that are outside of the individual. So they're beyond our individual genes. They're beyond our individual behaviors. They are, in fact, the context of our lives. The social determinants of health are all of the things that surround us and that we experience. what's available to us and how much it costs in terms of food, healthcare. And then there are some of us who can easily walk out of our house in the morning and walk around and be comfortable doing that and be able to get our exercise that way, be able to see our neighbors, be able to have fun. And those of us who doing that is actually dangerous. And it's not just the danger that impacts our health, it's the stress of that danger and chronic stress has huge impacts on, on what it means for us and our health. We know it from the biology 
So if you don't have control over your life and forces are mostly acting upon you, you're in a state of reactivity all of the time. And that kind of hijacks your body into physiological manifestations that are not good for your health. Your immune system, your brain function, endocrine pathways, so the way that hormones affect your brain function and your immune system, the ways in which your experiences and the environment you're in affect how your genes are regulated. So what genes get turned on or turned off that have different health effects. We're down over 16% and seeing a 600 point loss. I'll give you one example of a study that we did that looked at foreclosure, home foreclosure, when we had the Great Recession. And we showed very clearly that home foreclosure is associated with greater risk for depression. Now, we're talking about clinical depression, real serious depression symptoms that are debilitating. Depression then is associated with all sorts of physical illness. It's associated with diabetes, associated with obesity, associated with heart disease. That means that if your home is getting foreclosed on, you are more likely to have diabetes. And, and we do not tend to make that connection. We tend to think of diabetes and heart disease as in the realm of doctors. But the lesson that's been learned over the past several decades of science is that ultimately what causes these conditions is the world around you. And being foreclosed on, being displaced from your home is one of those causes. It doesn't take a lot of fancy studies to show that a person who is struggling with just meeting their basic needs and is not able to drive their life with the purpose that they've chosen has less good health than others. If you think about it, it's like a puzzle, uh, a lot of us aren't getting those pieces that we need. And it's not because that we're not, you know, capable of putting the puzzle together, it's that we just don't have those pieces. It's like going into a store and you have a puzzle. You buy it and you bring the box home and it's supposed to be a thousand pieces and you have 74 pieces. No matter what you do, if you're only having certain populations get a 74 piece puzzle out of a thousand, they're not going to attain that full opportunity of health. And I think what we're missing here is that we assume that people just don't have the pieces or they haven't put the pieces together right. Really what it is that we design society in such a way that only certain folks get actually all the pieces to begin with. 80% of Americans, 80% of Americans, their health is falling behind the rest of the world. There's not a few people, there's four in five Americans. It's really only 20% of Americans, 20 to 25% of Americans who are catching up and keeping pace with the rest of the high income world. But four in five Americans, their health is falling behind compared to other comparable countries. And the reason for that is because they have some measure of disadvantage along with the conditions that shape our lives and that shape our health. At the core underlying many of these conditions is power. I grew up in a small town in rural Iowa. While I was growing up there, I grew up there during the 80s, which was the, during the farm crisis. There was a massive labor strike in the meatpacking plant in our town. A lot of people were losing their farms. I went to the elementary school where all the kids' dads were on strike. And it was a long strike. It was about a year and a half, and they lost. And so everybody lost their jobs or had to come crawling back for far less benefits and wages than they had made before. And the trajectory of our town after that looked like a shuttered downtown, people leaving if they could get out, and if you couldn't, you got stuck. And the amount of shame, humiliation, and um, grief that impacted people's lives was something that was just sort of like a backdrop of my upbringing. One of the things I was wrestling with a lot is like, why did the story have to end that way? Could the story, could it have gone a different way? Was there a different path? And is there a different path that communities and people can take? And I became really interested in the question of, if people had had more power, would the story have ended differently? 
There are a lot of ways that you can break down power. Power is the ability to act. For me, the easiest way to understand power is to use the Spanish word poder, which means to be able to, to have the ability to do something. There's a quote from Dr. King that says, Power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. Whether it's good or bad depends on the purpose. When you think about that capacity, um, it takes many different forms. Uh, there are different sources of power. The power of force and physical violence. The House will be in order. Power of state action and government. The bill is passed. Wall Street and the NASDAQ. Power of the marketplace and money and wealth. People power, just sheer numbers. The power of ideas. the power of social norms and our ability in often unspoken ways to determine what's normal, what's okay, what's proper or correct behavior. Imagine the person you know who has the most power. That person probably also has a good level of education. They probably have a good job with a very solid income. The ability to influence people in their workplace. They get to tell other people what to do. The reverse, which is the person who you imagine has the least power, that would probably be a person who is having trouble having access to steady employment and a steady income, has difficulty accessing stable housing, maybe is engaged in the criminal justice system, and probably the bodies that make decisions and representation look the least like them. They don't see themselves as reflected in those organizations. To really feel it, to really imagine and, and, and to touch that map of power, um, I invite you just to take a walk. Wherever you may live, just walk a few blocks and notice how much or how little public transit there is. Walk and take a look at what point the housing stock is going from kind of run down to nicer. Are there parks in this part of town? And are the parks maintained? Who's in those parks? Take a look at the shops on the street. Those shops serving? Who did those shops used to serve? That doesn't just happen. Whenever you pull the thread of any of these things that you're just observing on your daily walk, the more you get to the central question of all power in civic life, which is this who decides? Who decided? Who decided that there should or shouldn't be a bus stop here? Who decided that the economic development dollars of your city should go toward trying to lure in some fancy big company rather than trying to help small businesses? The question who decides is at the very heart of beginning to understand your own power. I tend to think of power, money, and place as being at the heart of it all. And that has really important implications because power is distributed, or one would could argue not well distributed, in many ways. The design of our streets and our blocks are defined and designed often by government. Which school is available to us? Where healthcare institutions are located? All of these things are public decisions not a decision any one individual makes, it's a decision we make collectively. And they're decisions that have been made generation over generation. And in doing so, they're decisions that got made oftentimes 
when a concern about equity wasn't a priority. Some communities getting much more and some getting much less. And that has made a huge difference on the communities that we see today. For me, I'm thinking about, for example, if I do work on housing and community development, and there's a city council meeting that's gonna be talking about affordable housing, and it's at one o'clock in the afternoon, and the folks that are concerned, most concerned and most affected by the lack of affordable housing are probably working during that meeting. What does that tell us about power and how power is operating there? Who's setting the rules of engagement for how we're gonna have the discourse regarding affordable housing? Uh, whose voice will be included in that conversation and whose voice will be excluded systematically because we decided, hey, let's talk about affordable housing at one o'clock in the afternoon when the folks most burdened by affordable housing won't be able to make it there, right? I think in American life, we are always dealing with this tension, this conflict between two things. On the one hand, we have this creed of equality. One nation. That promises everybody a fair shot and pursue the American dream. And then on the other hand, we have a power structure in the United States that has always favored a wealthy few, that has always favored people who were called white over those who were not called white, that has always favored men over women. And the structure and the compounding power and advantage and privilege that accrues to people who are wealthy, white, and male has been the reality of American economic and civic life from nearly the beginning. When you alone are not enough, the instinct in American life too often is to blame yourself, to say, this must be on me. I must be a failure. I must be not working hard enough. I must not be good enough. America is open to everybody who hustles. I must not be hustling enough. And sure, hustle's good, grit matters, all that stuff is important, but so much of our culture and so much of the narrative focuses on the individual in a way that makes individuals blame themselves for what is not, in fact, an individual failing. Yes, take responsibility for whatever choices you've made. Do more and do all that you can. But hit the pause button and realize there is a whole set of multi-generational structural choices that have been going on, that have been advantaging certain people over others. us together can change that is to stop suffering in individual isolation, to stop thinking that this is just a matter of private pain and private shame, but to name it and to say, you know what, this isn't just on me. We all are feeling this pain. Sometimes people ask me, well, what, what, what should I do to be as healthy as possible? And the answer is you should choose to be born to wealthy parents. There probably is no better documented association in all of epidemiology than the relationship between income and health. You see consistently, not just in the US, that the higher your income or the higher your educational attainment, the better your health status, is, right? In the United States, in the richest 5% of people, they have a life expectancy of about 15 years more than the poorest 5%. When you get to the 17 year mark, you're really talking about the difference between knowing your grandchildren. That's a huge difference, a deeply unfair difference. 
So we can see consistently in the public health data that where you are social class wise is a pretty good predictor of where you're going to be health wise, right? So we've seen this through various studies that are based on your work environment. So where you are within your institution of work. So whether you're like the CEO, whether you're an upper level manager, uh, whether you're a mid-level or lower level manager, whether you're a secretary, whether you're a custodian or something like that. The higher you are up in terms of your social position, your social status, your class status within the institution, the higher you are, the better you are. And as you go down those levels, the health status goes down as well. So it's not just this idea that there's the rich and the poor. There's a gradient everywhere in between. Life expectancy in the U.S. is, you know, one of the lower life expectancies for like a wealthy and developed country, right? And so from that, you can kind of infer that if you transpose our social class gradient to a country that has a higher life expectancy in general, that even a CEO that's making the most money here in the U.S. is probably going to live a little shorter life than someone in another country. How do we get to an economy in which the wealthiest 1% of us account for nearly a quarter of the nation's wealth? How do we get to an economy where the richest 400 American families have as much wealth as 150 million other Americans? It didn't just happen overnight. It happened because of this many-layered, multi-generational uh, set of choices, ways in which policy and structure reinforced each other. This is America. The post-war period from about 1945 to the early 1970s were a period in which there were lots of problems of racial discrimination in housing markets and labor markets, but there was also a kind of broad sense of opportunity. If you look at the income disparities in the United States between 45 and the mid-1970s, Profits rose, but wages rose by about the same percent. If you look at points on the income distribution, those at the 90th percentile, 10% making more, 90% making less, 80th, 50th, at the bottom, etc. Almost all boats were lifting as the economy was expanding. Let's go, America! This was a period of seemingly shared prosperity. Now, there were big issues. African Americans, Latinos, racial minorities were fighting hard to break their way in to a full inclusion in that American economy, but those struggles were going forward. All power to the people! From the 1970s, 1980s on, we wind up finding a society in which the share of income going to the top 10% and the top 1% keep increasing dramatically. I'm Robin Leach with those champagne wishes and caviar dreams. Racial disparities, which were beginning to shrink through the 60s and 70s, have basically been frozen in place since where they were in the late 1970s. We found growing income inequality really stagnant progress and sometimes retrogression in terms of dealing with racial inequality. Also part of that history um, is a counter-narrative. The narrative of the economy and the narrative of what it means to prosper in the United States has always been a narrative of the rugged individual who is not constrained by government and regulation. And we worship the great heroic entrepreneur, the Steve Jobs, the Thomas Edison, the John D. Rockefeller, 
and then they build great fortunes, and then hopefully their fortunes will trickle down to the rest of us. So unless we understand that we're sort of actively generating this inequality, that it's not just legacy that we need to work against, but we need to re-engineer the future of our economy to provide more opportunities to people, we're not really going to get a handle on this problem. When I was growing up, I was taught in American history books that Africa had no history, and neither did I. That I was a savage, about whom the less said the better, who had been saved by Europe and brought to America. And of course, I believed it. I didn't have much choice. Those were the only books there were. Everyone else seemed to agree. If you walk out of Harlem, ride out of Harlem, downtown, the world agrees. What you see is much bigger, cleaner, whiter, richer, safer. And it would seem then, of course, that it's an act of God, that this is true, that you belong where white people have put you. So the reactions to race module is an optional module on the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which CDC does with states every year, telephone survey. The six questions on this optional module are, how do other people usually classify you in this country? Would you say white, black or African-American, Hispanic or Latino, Asian, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, American Indian or Alaska Native or some other group? How often do you think about your race? Would you say never? once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day, once an hour, or constantly. Within the past 12 months at work, do you feel you were treated worse than, the same as, or better than people of other races? Within the past 12 months, when seeking health care, do you feel your experiences were worse than, the same as, or better than for people of other races? Within the past 30 days, have you experienced any physical symptoms? For example, tensing of your muscles or a pounding heart? as a result of how you were treated based on your race. Within the past 30 days, have you felt emotionally upset, for example, angry, sad, or frustrated as a result of how you were treated based on your race? It's a very important thing for people to understand that race is not something that you're born with. Race is something that you're assigned in a race-conscious society. You are born with ancestry. So you're born with parents and grandparents and great-grandparents behind you that give you biologic ancestry and cultural ancestry and ethnicity, if you will. But you are assigned a race in a race-conscious society. And the actual label that you get might differ from place to place across the planet, right? So for me in the U.S., I'm clearly black. In some parts of Brazil, I'm just as clearly white. In South Africa, I'm clearly colored, right? And. If I were to stay in any of those settings long enough, my health would probably take on that of the group to which I've been assigned, even though I'd have the same genes in all three places. In the United States, you cannot avoid the influence of race on a lot of these forces. That comes back from one of the country's original sins, slavery. Areas where slavery was allowed are also areas where you have higher heart disease and higher stroke to this day. The dark legacy of uh, slavery in this country has shaped everything else around it. it has shaped income, it has shaped wealth, it has shaped housing availability. It has shaped availability and access to better education. All of that ultimately goes on to shape health. You know, for example, work that I did in Baltimore that shows that there's like a 21 year gap in life expectancy between two neighborhoods that are like three miles apart. Well, one neighborhood is like 98% African American and another neighborhood is 98% white. And historically, the African-American neighborhood was subjected to redlining and racial segregation, right? And there's a kind of a systematic disinvestment into that, that neighborhood. When we see the life expectancy difference, it didn't happen overnight, right? 
And so we gotta start asking ourselves, well, what is it about these two neighborhoods that is so different? There are studies that show well that uh, you take a, uh, someone black, someone white, at comparable levels of income. The person who's black on many health measures has actually worse health than the person who's white, despite the fact they have comparable levels of income. When I did my PhD, I actually, out of the, my findings, developed what I call my accelerated aging hypothesis, which is twofold. The first part of my accelerated aging hypothesis is that black-white differences in health outcomes in the United States are due to the accelerated aging of the black population compared to the white population. Mine came from looking at distributions of blood pressure across 40 years, all of these national surveys, and observing that black and white blood pressures for girls, 5 to 14, were identical. Blood pressure increases with age for black women and white women by the time you compare the blood pressure distribution of black women who are 25 to 34, it's identical to the blood pressure distribution of the white women who are 35 to 44, and that kind of identicality carries on. Arlene Geronimus observed about the same time that I observed that for young women giving birth, that the birth outcomes for the babies were better if the white woman was in her 20s, but the birth outcomes for the babies was better for black women if the black women were in their teens. And she hypothesized that the black mother's bodies were being weathered compared to the white. The second part of the accelerated aging hypothesis is that that accelerated aging of the black population compared to the white population is due to racism. Heart attacks are three times higher among non-whites than whites. Uh, strokes are three times higher. You can go right down the list. Uh, maternal deaths are higher. Infant deaths are twice as high for non-white babies as white babies. And when you ask yourself why this happens and what racism means, well, this is one area where it's clear to see what it means. So I went to Stanford Medical School. I applied to Hopkins to the School of Public Health. I was accepted, I did my MPH there. With all of this background, I'm now challenging my attending physicians. Why are we trained to talk about the patient's age, race, and sex? For example, I might say, this 18-year-old black female presents with abdominal pain. Why do I need to know her blackness? How is that going to distinguish her from the 18-year-old white female who presents with abdominal pain? So anyway, I challenged my attendings. Why are we doing this? And some of the answers came back like very glib, like, oh, it helps us identify the patient in the ER. But the basis of it was really that was the best data that people had. When we had health data, we understood that Black people more, more likely than white people to have sickle cell disease or sarcoid or whatever, and that's how the data were. So then I started asking myself, what does this variable race actually measure? If you just went on the street, if I asked you, what does race measure, right? You say, well, some combination of social class, culture, and genes. But when you actually look at it, race is a very rough marker for social class. The majority of white folks in the past, and still the plurality of poor people in this country are white. Not all black people are poor, so there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence there. What about race as a marker for culture? Well, there's not one white culture. There's not one black culture, Latino culture, and people who come from the Caribbean or come from West Africa, all labeled as black in this country, would have very different cultures. So race is an even poorer marker for culture. 
And then what about race as a marker for genes? Well, we have mapped the human genome, and we know that there is no basis in the human genome for racial subspeciation. So here's the challenge then. If race is just a rough marker for social class, but even rougher for culture, meaningless for genes, why is it such a good predictor of health outcomes? Then you have to ask, what is it actually measuring? And the same race that might be checked off for me if I go into a hospital, and that becomes part of a health statistic. That same race is the same race that a taxi driver notices, or a teacher, or a judge in a courtroom, or a police officer. So what race is actually measuring is the impacts of racism in our race-conscious society. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Today in Little Rock, the school is peacefully integrated. Racism plays two roles. Racism plays the role of putting a level of chronic stress on uh, people who are discriminated against and experiencing prejudice. For a long time, it was not fully understood the level of stress that that can cause and what that means for our health. Racism plays a second impact. It excludes people from opportunity. Racism applied in the workplace for jobs, applied in expulsions on kids in school. It impacts the opportunities that people can get access to. And that double whammy of impacting the social determinants and what you have opportunity to to create your health and causing the everyday daily stress of being discriminated against has a huge impact on health. What did they get called for? Because there are two black guys sitting here meeting? Yes, I did. Well, what did they do? What did they do? Just someone told me what they did. They didn't do anything. I saw the entire thing. Now to the new video tonight of a CEO of a tech company lashing out at Asian American families while at a restaurant in California. We're not in Mexico. We're in America. I'm going to call the police. You don't run into people. I'm a citizen here. You're not. You're an ugly foreigner. So you. Go back to whatever fucking Asian country you belong in. Okay, racist. Go back to wherever you came from. This is our property. You don't get to take it. Racism is a system, not an individual character flaw, not a personal moral failing, not even a psychiatric illness, as some people have suggested. It's a system of power, of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. It's gonna be a black male in a white T-shirt. Several more units over here, there's gonna be a problem. Shots fired! 21, we have shots fired, we have one suspect down. Yet another white police officer said to have killed an unarmed black man. In the death of Freddie Gray. Breonna Taylor. Jacob Blake. How dare we hate what we are? Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Ahmaud Arbery. We need justice for yes. our son. Both of John, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, Eric Garner. You try to have hope, but this what happens. What am I to tell my son when he grows up? I don't have faith in anything. Nothing. When we as a nation are so narrowly focused on the individual that it makes systems and structures either invisible or irrelevant, that's part of how the power happens. We have historically disempowered populations who do not fit within some norm. And we have said that these groups are to be disempowered. And when that's, that group is disempowered, we take away the assets and resources that they need to be healthy. 
federal agents raided a home yesterday housing dozens of smuggled undocumented immigrants. USA! USA! Children learning one of their parents was among the hundreds detained. Please let him breathe. Many children remain separated from their parents as reunification efforts proceed. We know that if people are not seen, not really recognized, they actually don't thrive. Part of what we all need is to be seen. In a sense, if we don't recognize people in terms of themselves, they actually lose themselves. When you have a differential between groups, the dominant group is what is better known than the subordinate group or marginalized group. We know everything about the dominant group. We know so much about them, we don't even recognize that it's dominance. To give you an example, growing up, they used to have things called skin tone band-aids. They weren't my skin tone, they were white. But people didn't think of them as band-aids for whites, it was just skin tone. And what was skin tone at the time? Skin tone was white. Being part of a dominant group means that you're recognized, you're seen. The part of power is the power to be seen, the power to be heard, the power to occupy space. And if it's widespread enough, like I said, it's not recognized as power at all. It just is. One Saturday, I was studying with some of my friends in my apartment. And we got to studying long and hard, and it got late, and we got hungry. So we go into town and we find a restaurant. And we walk into the restaurant and we sit down and the menus are presented and we order our food. The food is served. As I sat there eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign. And that sign was a startling revelation to me about racism. What did the sign say? The sign said, open. So now I know I've lost most of you. If I hadn't thought anything more about it, I would have assumed that other hungry people could walk in, sit down, order their food, and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of those signs, I recognized that now, because of the hour, but that now the restaurant was indeed closed, and that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of the sign, would not be able to come and sit down, order their food, and eat. And that's when I understood how racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures a dual reality. And for those who are sitting in the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it's difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. When you are politically and economically less powerful, when you are isolated politically and economically, you will tend to feel less hopeful about your prospects. You will tend to feel less agency. You will tend to feel isolated and lonely. And you will tend to feel less resilience and have less resilience in the face of kind of the ongoing grind of everyday life. Sometimes people feel like, oh, this problem is too big for me. What can I do? You're talking about racism? You're talking about power dynamics in the United States? What can I do? The question is not, what can I do? That's because we're narrowly focused on the individual, right? The question should be, what can we do? 
we can and we must insert ourselves at every turn, every chance we can into the process of decision making. Every one of us can take inventory of the kinds of power that you have and the kinds of power that you've had a chance to practice in your life. It doesn't matter how poor or rich you are. You can be a non-native English speaker. You can be just brand new to this country. You have some form of power. We are the immigrants! We are the immigrants! It might be people power, the ability to mobilize numbers of people. Down, down with deportation. Up, up with liberation. It might be ideas power, the ability to kind of put a new idea out there that gets people excited and mobilized. Protect, improve, and extend. Medicare for all is our plan. It might be changing social attitudes and norms about what's acceptable. Gay, straight, black, white, marriage is a civil right. Whatever form of power you have in whatever circles you move in, take that inventory, take that accounting. And when you do, a very simple thing starts to arise. You realize, I have this little mound of capital. Money capital, ideas capital, people capital, whatever it is, right? Take stock of that. Once you look at that mound, you realize, I have a very simple binary choice. Shall I hoard or shall I circulate? You have to make a clear and affirmative choice and a recommitment to be a circulator and not a hoarder. It's a practice that's inherently dangerous because they use very dangerous chemicals, incredibly close to where people live, for which we have a perfectly safe alternative. To be able to confront that kind of power, the power of the oil industry, but also the power of a practice that we've just done forever and don't think of, that's what really fired up all of our communities. Ordinary people, when they come together, can do extraordinary things. That power to make extraordinary things happen that everyday people have is really needed right now. It's almost hard to imagine things being different, but it's a muscle we need to build. And then we started to talk about, well, who are the community groups that are impacted? Who are the people whose voices are important to be at this table? And who are our storytellers? This is the ground zero for pollution. We tell stories about we. We tell stories that invite people in. We present people in their complexity and their fullness and their humanness. And to also tell us, do we belong? We need to belong. The more we can belong, the better we are, the healthier we are. Are you with me? We want to tell the people who are living next to those wells, your lungs are beloved, and we're going to show that we love you by actually stopping this really dangerous practice. We are unstoppable! To actually make that happen, we had to organize and we had to be a strong power. What do we want? Climate justice! When do we want it? Now! Power building means making power fair. It says that all people matter, that they have a right, to a life that is healthy and happy, and that we have a responsibility to each other to not block people from that life. We've been able to, on a number of occasions, turn out hundreds of people for demonstrations. No more pollution! Visits to City Hall. This is a coalition of unusual partners with broad reach throughout the community, and that's how we're building power, by bringing together authentic community voices. The thing that makes we the people, in fact, powerful is remembering that we are not alone. It is remembering that there is power in numbers and remembering that freedom is not just a freedom to be free from obstruction and free from rules, that freedom is responsibility to each other. That freedom is weaving together community with a spirit that says we're in it together. When we started this, people were like, you're never gonna get people to even think about this. And we were told things like, don't talk about keep oil in the ground because they'll think you're too radical. 
But now we're part of, that's the debate now. That's the, the dialogue and the narrative that's coming out of this battle. That is a real victory in terms of changing what's possible. So when we started, nobody thought it was possible to end oil drilling in Los Angeles. Now we're just talking about when, and we're talking about how to make sure that we protect the health of all of our communities. My health ultimately is affected by the health of those around me. And this really is a strong, I think, compelling argument why we should all, we should all care about the conditions of the world around us. Well, we all need to understand that there is no separation between a healthy world and healthy us. We had a David and Goliath battle, but did not lose hope because in that story, David won. Power and Health was made possible by a grant from the California Endowment.